35 million years ago, high above an icy Siberian river, the midnight sky suddenly went bright. A five kilometer chunk of rock and iron screamed through the atmosphere at 44 times the speed of sound, erupting into a white hot fireball that burned twice as bright as the full moon. It survived the trip and collided with the tundra so hard and so hot, the shockwave instantly formed trillions of carats of diamonds, then fused them into a substance never seen before in this solar system polycrystalline diamond, likely the toughest, slickest, most thermally conductive natural substance. But the 200 million kilograms of diamonds in the Papagai impact structure were never mined, and they likely never will. Sealed beneath Siberian permafrost hundreds of miles from civilization, it was easier to make our own. This is a synthetic polycrystalline diamond, and it was not formed by a 54,000 kph space rock. Oh no, the machine that made this was far more powerful. This one, in fact, a little small, isn't it? Yo, let's watch a million PSI, 1400 degrees, and a touch of cobalt turn ugly yellow sand into a record shattering superstone that shreds through rock and makes the only 3D printer nozzle worthy of a chef's kiss. Ladies, gentlemen, and cyborgs, welcome to Void Star Lab. Today, the high pressure world of polycrystalline diamond. If you're a subscriber to my channel, nudge nudge wink wink, you may have watched me roast random crap from my spam folder. It all started here, the diamondback nozzle, a 3D printer nozzle tipped with a polycrystalline diamond. This was my very first review and one of the few to earn my highest grade. I had teams of marketing people asking me, what did we do during this January? That's Mark, director of BizDev at Diamondback. I said, I did, we didn't run a campaign, but we had a YouTuber. When I ran into him and his team at the Rocky Mountain Rep Rap Fest, they they invited Brooke and I to tour their facility in Orem, Utah. We thought we would just see some factory workers make these nozzles, but what we saw was these nozzles making this factory work. The sun is shining, the path is winding, and this ad is not going to read itself. This episode is sponsored by Diamondback, my favorite nozzle on the Citadel. Before you ring me for conflicts of interest, I announced this video in my original review. I was going to do this whether they sponsored or not. The point I'm trying to make here is I am not shilling for Diamondback. I scammed them. So instead of reading bullet points, I will just show you our road trip, because this is what America really looks like. At least the parts between Denver and Orem not yet paved in Best Buys or parking lots for Best Buys. We drove under spacious skies, past amber waves of grain through Purple Mountain's majesty. I'm not sure if Palisade counts as a plane, but it was fruited. Just look at this gorgeous gorge. This was once called Defiance, Colorado, before it was rebranded to Glenwood Springs by a legendary Karen, and fine, I'll, I'll fast forward. Welcome to Utah! And now, welcome to Orem, Utah, birthplace of the Diamondback. Diamondback is a division of Champion X, one of the first American companies to mass produce synthetic diamond. Overseas manufacturers figured out the tech and curb stomped the wholesale market, so they pivoted to what's basically diamond refining. This facility is not making diamonds, they're upgrading them from cheap commodities into record breaking polycrystalline products. Their best sellers are cutting teeth for mining tools that shred through the hardest bedrock. And and bearings that can still run when they're full of water or sand. The diamonds grind the sand to a microscopic powder and then use the powder as a lubricant. That has nothing to do with this episode, I just thought it was cool. So why sell nozzles? Well, it wasn't the original plan. Before the Diamondback was even a scribble on one of their many, many whiteboards, 3D printing was already the secret sauce running through the whole facility, like a river of sauce. Almost every task at every workstation involves something 3D printed, a jig, a bracket, a gizmo of some type. Some have entire 3D printed trays of 3D printed tools docked on 3D printed brackets labeled with 3D printed nameplates. I think a better question is, why? Why diamonds? So everyone knows diamond is the hardest substance. If you watch two episodes of Bill Nye, you'll know this can scratch anything, and the only thing that'll scratch it is another diamond. But this mineral actually holds a lot of records. For instance, it has one of the lowest coefficients of friction against almost anything, making it super slippery in all situations. But wait. There's more. Something that's not very well known is the thermal properties. Meet Harris, Managing Director of Diamondback Nozzles. Some people even think uh, diamond's an insulator, but it's the exact opposite. It's one of the best thermal conductors out there, better than any other material that's available on the market. Check this out. I have heated identical disks of brass, steel, tungsten carbide, ruby, and diamond, and placed each one on a block of ice. The diamond disk cools down so fast, my infrared camera could barely see it happen. This works the other way too. Here's 
here's how a conventional brass nozzle heats up, and this is a diamond tip diamond back. The diamond at the tip heats up before the brass that's carrying it. What that translates to is you're replenishing the energy, replenishing that heat, so you're going to have less propensity of clogging, you're going to have a lot more consistent extrusion of the plastic. A lot of users come back and say, hey, I tried printing this TPU and I wasn't able to, but with the diamond back I now can. If diamond is so red at literally everything, why are we still using steel nozzles, carbide cutters, and basic bitch ball bearings? Allow me to demonstrate. If you're just listening to this in the background, I just use baby's first ball peen hammer to instantly vaporize the hardest material on earth. Okay, it's the second hardest. Shut up, commenters. I'll fucking do it again. I like smashing diamonds with a hammer. Diamonds are certainly not forever. That is an authentic, documented with receipts conspiracy involving an alleged cartel that allegedly murders alleged indentured children and has so much money that my lawyer told me I had to put allegedly in front of every word in the sentence. Allegedly. Every diamond you're going to see in this episode is synthetic, and don't worry about the cost of all these diamonds I'm smashing. If I were to buy this entire vial on AliExpress, it would cost $1.63 not including the vial. I doubt Champion X actually buys their diamonds from Alibaba, but they also don't produce them on site. They're actually a huge consumer of diamonds. What they do is grind it up, micronize it as fine and fluffy as flour, and then convert it into a shiny, glassy black disc, more likely to shatter the hammer. It all starts here. A technician dispenses a small portion of powdered diamond grit into a hollow capsule made of cobalt metal. He caps it with a tungsten carbide cylinder called the substrate and packs it in a block of so-called gasketing material. The next step is what we came for, reproducing a white-hot terminal velocity meteor at industrial scale. The magic happens at the very center of this colossal hydraulic press. I don't mean this particular press, they have like 80 of them. So what we have here are the different factories uh, where the diamond can be manufactured. Any one of these has the capability to produce the diamond that goes into the diamondback nozzles. The technician carefully loads the payload into the danger zone using the special arm and a guidance camera. Almost every tool in this facility, the dispenser, the press, are printed, machined, or assembled in-house. That arm, it's Granny's Reacher Grabber on a 3D printed bracket controlled by a bicycle brake handle. This is why I had to weirdly crop and redact a few shots. Diamondback's most critical lie in these seemingly trivial details. With the powder package in position, everything is set. Just clear the area and hit the big red button. I wish they let me hit the big red button. I love hitting a big red button. It's my favorite size and color of button, plus my favorite thing to do with it. Here, I'm, I'm gonna hit Mark Rober's button. Behind the steel blast door sits a specially engineered pumping system the size of a small car, driving a cage of hydraulic rams and solid steel struts. As its six tungsten carbide anvils mash together, the gasketing material compresses into a solid seal. It's critical that every gap gets filled to prevent an explosive blowout. That was fun to say. More than 6.9 gigapascals of pressure, nice, bear down on a mere 20 cubic millimeters of diamond, carbide, and cobalt. High voltage AC surges through the workpiece, and its own electrical resistance causes it to heat up over 1,400 degrees Celsius. The bonds between two carbon atoms are really, really strong. Diamonds are so hard because they are, oops, all carbon. The atoms form a repeating pattern of pyramids and cubes, this uniform three-dimensional crystal structure that's equally strong in all directions. But this also introduces a major weakness. Those bonds are lined up along so-called cleavage planes. Let's be mature about this. The tiniest crack, I said let's be mature about this, sets off a chain reaction that spreads across the whole crystal till the whole shebang is cleft in twain. Diamond wants to be a single consistent carbon crystal, but Diamondback's press convinces it otherwise. Pressure and heat have reached operating levels, and they hold steady for, full, full of fur. And they hold steady full of full of fur. You messed up that line exactly <laughs> the same way twice in a row. I'm basically a human tape recorder, Brooke. Once it goes into the press, it's in there for roughly 10 minutes, and then it comes out as a solid, solid disc. The diamond grit is coming together into a solid hole, but it's not aligning into one big crystal. The extreme heat and pressure forcibly fuse the microcrystals where they are at chaotic, random angles. Now, a sharp impact can't run through the whole stone. The damage reaches the end of a microcrystal, and it basically hits a wall. It's not the right angle to damage the next one. It's got diamond to diamond bonds. It's not 
say in a matrix, but rather true diamond to diamond bonding in that, in that disc. That's what makes this particular brand of polycrystalline diamond different. The tiny crystal bits are not glued together by the cobalt. They are fused atom to atom in a single solid chunk called a slug. The cobalt isn't holding it together, it's trapped inside. That's why diamond backs diamonds black. <laughs> I've actually been showing you an older generation press. Their newer designs can build even more pressure to fuse even larger slugs. Everything about it is a super duper top secret confidential redacted. It's that secret. But to put it in perspective, this was their original prototype. The one I can't show you is to this what this is to that. Back in the press bay, the cycle is coming to an end. The circuit breaks, the pump releases, and the sudden pressure change blows the gaskets down a chute and into a trash can. Once the slug cools, a technician cracks the gasket and remnants of the capsule with a small shear and knocks off the crust. This thing just survived a million PSI, it'll handle a hammer, but just in case, a worker dabs a few samples with a fluorescent ink and checks for fractures under a black light. Note how the tungsten carbide substrate has fused to the diamond disc. This acts like a handle to make it easier to work the material. Meanwhile, the technician is already filling up a new capsule and carrying it out to the press. Unless something breaks, every one of these bays is cranking these things out one after another three shifts per day. But that's it, the diamond is done. Every remaining step, all the chaos on the factory floor is just shaping the slug and bonding it to an end product. It continues through several processes to get it into the final geometry. You gr a lot of grinding. We, we consume so many uh, diamond grinding wheels. If you think about it, you've got to have something harder than what you're trying to machine. Well, in our case, the best we can do is diamond. This factory built to produce diamonds is one of America's largest diamond consumers. This facility is made of three buildings, each split into product divisions and further carved into work cells. So what, what we have here is a layout of a production floor. Uh, each of these are the individual machines that we have out there. These have been 3D printed in our print lab. These are to scale too, and the purpose of this board is to allow our, our production managers to plan the process and plan, plan the flow. We've got the gas and electricity and everything running above rather than down where the machines are. So essentially you can you know, grab a machine and move it, and now you've got overhead utilities to support that machine. Every foot of factory floor is fully modular, so they can reconfigure whatever they want, whenever they want, to improve the process and experiment with new products. The Diamondback production line is up here next to the stock car. They do like pit crew drills as a training exercise. Someone here really likes NASCAR. This is where the magic happens, the Diamondback production line. We're gonna uh, steal one of the technicians. One awkward conversation later. This is Steven from the Champion X team. Why don't you explain exactly how the slug gets turned into a nozzle? We get our parts to deliver to us from our press and finish cells with the carbide still attached to the diamond. We'll just grind off as much of that carbide as possible. Diamond disc will be as flat as possible, so to get that nice smooth surface, we then grind it on our lapping plate here. Polish on the one side, rough on the other side. This is where we start our Shaping. While I'm showing lots of machinery, we can't peek inside. The CNC's and redacted are built to spec in-house. They're not off-the-shelf products. Exactly how they process diamonds at industrial scale is like the keys to the kingdom. Older designs like the Olsen Ruby insert the stone from the back. Maturity people. We're grown-ups. So the nozzle has this stair-stepped cross-section that messes with the flow and in some circumstances can even get pulled apart. The brass part of a diamond back is just a straight tube. The diamond tip inserts from the front and it's tapered on the inside. It's the diamond, the low friction part that's reducing the diameter from 1.75 millimeter filament to, for instance, 0.4 millimeter bore. We take all the tips, we blast them off in here uh, just to clean them off. The operator blasts away the grit and grime with baking soda. Then to get rid of the baking soda, they dip it in vinegar. But up to this point, it's only a tip. Now, it's about to have its bar mitzvah and become a nozzle. This bar mitzvah, they put the tip back on. The first of these presses snugs the tip into its new brass body, and the second crimps down a retaining ring to permanently lock it in. We'll do a final inspection, make sure the height is within the uh, criteria as well. Does every individual nozzle get inspected? Yes, 100%. Every single one? Every single one. This machine here, I will etch that uh, size on the nozzle and the serial number. And then we'll do a final inspection, make sure the nozzle is nice and clean, put it in the canister, we box it up, we fold every box individually, <laughs> and uh, package it with care every time. When it leaves our factory, it goes straight to finished goods, ready for shipping. Every single Diamondback nozzle that's not sent to a distributor like Matter Hackers, every one of them is built to order. When we have an order on Amazon, we're able to 
build and deliver a nozzle the same day. This whole facility has almost no inventory. Every tool has one specific home, written records physically follow the work in progress, and everyone is open to making material suggestions to improve the job. This is called Kanban with Kaizen. As long as it's continuously tuned with suggestions from the foot soldiers, the system makes everyone's job easier, it limits mistakes, and it doesn't crush anyone's soul under sheer monotony. As somebody who studied this stuff in business school, allow me to geek out for a second. I have never seen Kanban or Kaizen and done this well. It requires extreme discipline from management because in order for it to work, they have to trust their rank and file employees over their own judgment. This sh right here is what buzzwords like synergy and agility are supposed to be talking about. Every workstation of every cell is loaded with rapid prototyped elements. Most of these were invented by the same workers who end up using them every day. These things are designed and fabricated by Diamondback's 3D printing lab. This is both where they test the nozzles and also where they print stuff to use throughout the entire production process. Operator wants to do an improvement on their area. They'll come talk to us. We design the part. We do a lot of 3D printing for the uh, manufacturing side of our business. We use this 3D print lab to support either fixturing for machines, uh, parts for machines, or anything like that, really. This right here is where the Diamondback was invented, by workers busting their buns in the real world, not corporate drones brainstorming in a boardroom. We do use a lot of like nylons and uh, carbon fiber nylons, like Nylon X. Uh, we use a lot of uh, you know PETG for anything that's uh, fixturing. See, a standard material for professional printing is carbon fiber nylon, literally nylon with bits of carbon fiber all up in there. It's sturdy, stiff, and precise. But printing CF nylon is rough, and I mean that literally. The carbon fiber strands can sand down a brass nozzle before the print even finishes. The print lab tried switching to tool steel, which is hard enough to resist carbon fiber, but even those would wear out under the sheer volume of plastic the lab is squirting. We're going through a lot of filament. They go through a lot of filament. We're talking about, I mean, probably probably 10 to 20 spools a week. It is a lot of filament. Finally, our lab manager came to us and says, we're a diamond manufacturer. Could we not make a nozzle that would actually work? So we did. So they did. We make diamond. Could we make the whole thing out of diamond? They made the whole nozzle out of diamond. This turned out to be a little extra. How much would it cost to get a full diamond nozzle? Probably say a thousand dollars probably. So there's a common misconception of how abrasive filament damages a nozzle. It's not the filament moving through it, it's the nozzle dragging over it. Flowing molten plastic doesn't give the carbon fibers any leverage so it can't scour the insides, but as it leaves the nozzle, the cooling fan is turning it solid, which locks the fibers so they can grind away at the nozzle's face as it continues to move. If you make the nozzle from brass, which is great at conducting heat, but you make the tip from something harder that can resist the carbon fiber, you can get the best of both worlds. It took a few iterations, but their diamond-tipped prototype wouldn't just run CF nylon, it would run anything faster and better than the straight-up brass nozzle it was built to replace. Every single printer that we have here uh, we're running Diamondback nozzles. We do print with the nozzles, and that's one less thing that we have to worry about, for sure. This print farm's nozzles have collectively run almost two metric tons of filament. We've never actually worn one out yet, so <laughs> we're still waiting for that day, but it hasn't come yet. What do you think? Is it going to be like a sad day, or is it going to be like a celebration? We're going to have to put it up on the walls. In retrospect, it seems kind of obvious. So, like, why didn't anyone beat them to it? Well, they kind of did. I already showed you the ruby-tipped nozzle earlier, but there's also a version tipped with tungsten carbide, and there are even a few that are actually tipped or coated in diamond. All these materials, corundum carbide and conventional diamond, are all really brittle. If you let that thing slip from your fingers, if you put a minus sign on the Z-offset and it crashes into the plate if you tighten the nozzle a little too enthusiastically. Your tip shatters and you ruin everything. But the Diamondback prototype was a polycrystalline diamond, and the number one feature is impact resistance. We've actually had people, it's like, hey, I forgot to zero my, my offset, and it will just crush your, your whatever it is, glass plate, any type of plate on there, it'll just crush it. It was only a matter of time before somebody stroked their chin and thought, 
bet we can sell this thing. So they turned to the most trusted way to bring a new product to market guaranteed. We started with a Kickstarter to test, test the market. They only got 269 backers, which is 200 nice, but hardly a blockbuster. That said, it was probably for the best. We started the project about two and a half years ago and we went live um, about a year and a half ago. So it took us a full, probably a full year. But that meant they had to finish a round of production six months before they could finish the production process. When we first started out, we were getting one nozzle per disc. As for the rest of the disc, we just toss that. We can't use that diamond after that. But you don't melt them down and turn them into new diamonds. We should. <laughs> Diamondback nozzles are now available in five sizes and three widely compatible form factors and not a single corner has been cut along the way. Diamond's the same diamond. We have had no, no reason to change that. We haven't had any wear issues and don't anticipate ever having wear issues. We haven't had to, to tweak or change the design. What we launched with Kickstarter has, has performed well. They're still individually laser engraved with the serial number and bore diameter. They're still nestled in those signature glass topped can thing. It's a premium nozzle, premium product. We wanted that to shine through in the, in the product packaging as well. There's always new printers coming out and we're doing our best to respond to that. The future lies less in the diamond and more in everything around it, making more nozzles that fit more printers and simply convincing people that the diamond back is not snake oil. The logo is a snake, an oil-free snake. Oh, you ever tried non-lubricated snakes? It's the worst. <laughs> we think diamond is an underutilized engineering material. We think diamond on the nozzle tip is, is going to be tremendously successful and we're seeing success and hopefully you guys are seeing success as well. I still stand by my original opinion. I think it's a great product. There is no composite on earth that can do this tiniest fleck of damage to it. Not even diamond filament. That is for the next Every Filament episode. But for now, that is the incredible engineering that goes into and comes out of the Diamondback nozzle. I'd like to thank Harris, Mark, and the rest of the Diamondback crew who sponsored this video and gave me way more access and information than I honestly expected. I hope I didn't come across as too shillicious. Like, I truly like this product. It's got some really cool technology in it, and it was made by people who seem to really love their jobs and get treated well by their company. If you won't trust me unless I say something nasty, uh, here, this hopper of polishing compound was cracked. Get your shit together, Diamondback. I also gotta thank Brooke for coaxing me out of the workshop and into an adventure, and for driving over eight hours each way so I could document the voyage. Uh, don't worry, Brooke loves long drives. Th that's not a bit. We moved from New York to Denver in two and a half days, and one of those was waiting for a thunderstorm to end. This episode took over a month of prep and research, and it could never have happened without our generous patrons. Their support means I'm not forced to secrete disposable weekly wads of content just to keep the lights on. Every month, I shout out three random lab scientist supporters, and I tip my trilby to today's trio. Rodeo, Drew Gates, and True BW3. Special thanks to our collaborators, Turner Z, Moonkin, SXP, Schleppy the Schwagster, E to the iPie, Keep to Yourself, Caster the Catboy, Bitrot, What the Chuck, The Suits Ruined Our Fun, Dysfunctional Potato, and The Benevolent Misanthrope. I have hidden their names somewhere in this video and made them permanent parts of my workshop, even more permanent than these nozzles. Finally, let's thank our lab assistant supporters. These crazy diamonds, or in the English dub, Shining Diamonds, include Talon Democratic Socialist and a Pretty Righteous Dude Dash Zack, DBD, The Monk, Kermit the OG for Nathan Johnson, John Loves Jen, Socks McGox, Protagonist, Vorka, Brad Cox, Bryn Wolf, Schulte, Granville, Schmidt, The Lizards Are Watching, Zach, Jessica, Mauerhan, Matthew Arrington, In Bed, Microwave, Burn, Period Clots, King Shaming, Walrus, Thunder Chicken, Incognito, Bob Forbes, Nuclear, 314603, Sir Jack Cooper, The Second Wilder, Frying Pan, Circle Zero, A Corn, Onyx Plague, Agent Maxwell, Scroto Sagans, Good Suck, Juicy Legend Drinker, of juicy legendary fruits. Max Lux says you're too hard on yourself. Love yourself, idiot. My husband watches this shit, so hi, Urch. Colin J. Webb asserts that if corporations are people, they will all go to hell. I agree. Pascal's wager is why Void Star Lab is a single member LLC. Zak. Cameron Oglatree, Bob Dobbington, Hailey Kerman, Kirstie Wales, Ate My Gerbil in 2008, Voldemort, no! Orton Snyab, Rinry, Dempsters, Powerful CCH, Lydia K, Ryan Guler, Steven, Six Foot, Six Figure, Six Pack, Schulte, Eddie, Azunda Wielder of Iron Heater of Shrink, Danny Devoid of Life, Micah, My Brother is Flying Out Next Week to Visit Me, Friedman. 
Manhandling for panhandlers. 6A, 6F, 65, 6E, 75. General Buck Turgenson. SKL, Cody, Travis Hippa, Bill Schooler, RJ Dipcord. But seriously, ladies, gentlemen, cyborgs, every name I just read out loud is fake. Seriously, oh, with the real subscribers. <sighs> Cacophony of Failure, Michael Roche, Scrit R R R Ratchfinger, Quantumly Tangled, Zapf Michael, Transrights, Jamie, Dr. Mrs. The Mirrorman, Craft Computing, who I believe I met at Open Sauce. Did I? I don't remember. Sharia Coleslaw, Dennis Kempen, Bumtickly69, Pussy Nugget, Jason Karunamon, Not a Digimon, VPS Data, Aaron Steers, Blammo! Topher, every Bluetooth has a right to repair. I hate you all. Visit Omaha3dprints.com for all your 3D printed RPG product needs. Quality Doggo Sunburnt Cat, Boulder Creek Yard James, The Antifa! Nova Ren, I work on every resin video, it'll be out next week, I promise. Vo Bootsy von Poopstein, Elite Giant, Roger Pinkham of the Great Star Theater, Noah B. Johnson, I inspire the next layers. YouTube channel, so you guys should check it out. Measure once, cut twice, reglue, cut again. Vajelli, Dax, Dashardly, Seek, Seth, checks. VK, 2K, TJ, Big Bird, Tommy, what goes a bump in the night? The Cuddle Fish, My Dog is a Bear, Samuel Roos, Cindy Lauman, Ashley Coleman, Stormby Design, Rusty Flute, Dead Beef, Trump did nothing wrong, Nate, Call Sign, Carrot, Tegan, and Let's Fly Tail Wheels. Is that like a Sonic thing? Burn Duck 3, One Sleeve, Good Lady Nat, Queen of Lemons, Victor of the Great Citrus Wars, Zenforian, Cliff Henning, Amanishi, Kevin DeGraff, Doom Crew, Inks, Sticks like the river, not the band. Cross threading is just free Loctite. Adam Birch, Mike Kelly, Iron Rain, and Anthony Evans. A man of such monumental chattitude, he needs two first names. Thanks for watching, and may even the roughest jobs fail to wear you down. I will see you in the future.